I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show, and I welcome and congratulate Patricia O'Toole, whose new biography of Woodrow Wilson, entitled The Moralist, Woodrow Wilson and the World He Made, takes us into 100 years ago the predicates for the 20th century's disasters and successes and much of what we understand now about the contest between nationalism and internationalism was at least created for that language during the period of Woodrow Wilson's presidency. So it's extremely timely, but we begin with an event that is a celebration. It is November 5th, 1912, the election day of Woodrow Wilson. The news comes from Tumulty, his aide at the governor's office. Governor, Wils governor Wilson is no longer the president of Princeton University. He's the governor of New Jersey. But a contingent of Princeton undergraduates, young men, come to the president-elect's house. Wilson comes out on the porch and makes a speech to them. And included in that speech are the lines, I look almost with pleading to you, the young men of America, to stand with me. Patricia, good evening to you. Congratulations. Who is Woodrow Wilson at that moment, his, his triumph in the presidency? Well, thank you, John. I first want to say how nice it is to be here talking with history and biography, uh, talking history and biography with someone who loves history and biography, so thank you. Woodrow Wilson at that moment is kind of an unlikely presidential uh, uh, new president, I mean, president-elect. He has been uh, a university president, governor of New Jersey, before he was a university president, he was a professor. He knows government in a theoretical way very well. He's been studying it since he was a teenager. He has a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins. And he's only had two years of practical experience in politics itself as governor of New Jersey. Those two years were not burdensome to him because New Jersey had an operation, a boss, it was run uh, for the self-interest, as all state governments were at the time, nothing unusual. But this doesn't bother Woodrow Wilson. So we have to explore where he comes from, because he was not born in New Jersey. No, he was not born in New Jersey. He uh, came from the South. He was born in Virginia. When he was very young, his family moved to Georgia. A little bit later, they moved to South Carolina and then uh, North Carolina. So he's, he's really a son of the South, the Deep South. Um, and he goes to Princeton College in those days. Um, Enters 1875. 1875, graduates 1879. It was very much a Southern school in those days. Lots and lots of Southerners there. And in his entering class, there's nobody from north of New York City. Uh, those people all went to Harvard and Yale uh, or Columbia. But um, it's, it's very much oriented to the South. It's a Presbyterian institution. Um, and he's studying uh, history and political science. And um, at this time, he, he's already decided he wants a political career. Somebody found an old bookmark uh, of his in which he had made it over as a business card. And it said, Thomas Woodrow Wilson, Senator of Virginia. Yes. Um, so he's, he's thinking along those lines. Then he goes from Princeton to law school because he has noted that many politicians began as lawyers and sort of worked their way into politics. But the trouble is he doesn't like law at all. Um, it, it bores him silly. So he has to, he, he basically thinks his plan to be, become a politician is never going to materialize. At this point, an uncle suggests that he go to graduate school at Johns Hopkins, they have a new PhD in American history program, and he doesn't really have any other plans, so he goes and does this and resigns himself, really, to becoming a public intellectual. We, I don't think they had that term, but he was going to write and talk about uh, government. Talk and talk and talk. You emphasize it as a theme of your book that Woodrow Wilson relied upon and was a triumph with oratory. His father was a Presbyterian pastor, sermons. His grandfather was a pastor. He was, he was a man who was comfortable with oratory and could move the congregation, the crowd, the assembly with his words. Yes, that was key to who he was, and it was his greatest political skill, and let's say that to be a really great president, you need five skills, and certainly communications would be one of them. 
Um, but he, he never really developed the other ones. People told him he had to get better at human relations, and he just couldn't bring himself to do it. He was very shy, and he never took the initiative in forming a friendship. So things that, for example, Theodore Roosevelt did very easily, you know, if it was 11.30 in the morning and you were senator, bachelor of the Democratic Party in to have a meeting with him, ask him for something, um, at the end of the meeting he would say, Senator Bachelor, can you come up and have lunch with Mrs. Roosevelt and the children and right. me? Quentin was asking me about your dog just the other day. So you'd go, you'd have a wonderful time with this rollicking family, and you'd go back to the hill and think... I like this guy. You know, I'm going to vote with my party, but when I can support him, I will. So Wilson never, he couldn't do the getting liked thing. Wilson's wife was very, very well chosen by him and by fate. Her name was Ellen Axon. She was the daughter of a pastor. He met her, we saw her at church. It's a charming story. He was deeply in love with her and vice versa. They have children, daughters, and they have a very successful life. Was, was Ellen a strength to him, to his political skills? Absolutely. Um, she was uh, very much a domestic kind of person, embraced motherhood, but she cared about the advance of his career. And when he would be criticized for something, she read the newspapers very closely. He didn't. And so if some criticism came along that she thought was legitimate, she would talk to him about it and tell him, you've got to shape up on this score and maybe give him some advice about it. And he listened closely to her. He did listen closely to her. There's a moment when he's governor, when William Jennings Bryan, who at that point had run for president three times, he's kind of the standard bearer of the Democratic Party. Um, He's coming to Princeton, and Wilson is living in Princeton at this point, and uh, Ellen says, we have to have him for dinner. And Wilson did not admire William Jennings Bryan, thought he was kind of an airhead. Um, but uh, El- Ellen prevailed, and they had him to dinner, and Wilson actually liked him quite a bit more than he thought he would. So she was an important advisor to him. He makes a quick transition from scholar to professor. Uh, he was first at Bryn Mawr, then he's at a Wesleyan, and then he's invited to Princeton, He is eager to continue to lecture. He looks for outside finances. And then in 1902, my memory, uh, Princeton offers him the presidency. Why? What what was attractive about a man who was unsociable? He hardly, (laughs) I mean, Princeton is a social place, especially in those days. Good heavens. That's what the eating clubs are all about. So what was attractive about Woodrow Wilson to the the, uh, stewards of Princeton University? That's a really wonderful question. He... uh, was uh, a very popular professor. Very. So that was part of it. And he had done, he was invited to serve on various committees in the university, and he cared deeply about the future of Princeton. As a Princeton student, that was the experience, I think, that kind of unfurled him. You know, he made friends at Princeton. They were his only friends for life. Um, So he loved, he was thrilled to be asked back to teach there and uh, overjoyed to be asked to be president. He thought that was like the pinnacle, like what more could there be? And yet he immediately, not immediately, but he entered into a fight with the trustees and the donors who, who say is absolute in a university such as Princeton. And he wanted to graduate school in the middle of campus. We know now it's out at the golf course. I, I served I served supper there when I was playing huh. football for huh. Princeton. That's huh. what we did. We'd march out about a mile and a half to the campus and serve to these distinguished scholars. Wilson considered that a defeat. All right, save my feet. Why, <laughs> why, why did I have to march a mile? What was the battle? The battle was, um, you know, Wilson wanted um, Princeton to be a real community, and he didn't want the graduate students to be away from the undergraduates. And uh, what happened was there was a very wealthy donor who was cultivated by the dean of the graduate school. And um, he was going to give $500,000, an enormous sum in those days, for the building of the graduate school. So the dean very craftily said, well, why don't you say that you'll give it as long as we can locate it away from the main campus? So that was the condition attached to the gift. And uh, uh, Wilson 
thought that that was, um, you know, that was not a good transaction, that a donor should, in effect, be able to decide where the, the graduate school should be. And actually, there were, there were two fights. You know about the other yes, one. It was yes. over, over these eating clubs. And Wilson kind of misplayed his hand on that one, but I really agreed with him on the second fight about where the graduate school should be because that seems to me to be a prerogative of a president of a university. We're emphasizing this fight with the stewards and the donors because this is my version of a glimpse of the future. Wilson yes. going up against powerful forces with his moral absolute certainty yes. and losing. Yes. The book yes. is The Moralist. Yes. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson and the world he made will plunge into it immediately with Patricia O'Toole. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. <laughs>